Hello, my name is Andrew Collins and I'm a telly addict. Right, happy new year, clean slate, blank screen, breath of fresh air, new shirt. Let's resolve to kick off 2014 with something fresh and original. The plaintiff has frozen my bank account. Most of my assets are overseas where I can't get at them. I, I don't even know where I'm going to sleep tonight. No change there then. Well, it's fresh and original to ITV, birds of a feather. And I am blue, what a light. Running for nine popular series on BBC One between 1989 and 1998, it made household names of Pauline Quirk, Linda Robson and Leslie Joseph, and enshrined the names of cohabiting Essex sisters Sharon and Tracy into folklore. Creators Marx and Gran offered a revival of Birds of a Feather to the BBC, but were fobbed off, so ITV stepped in and scored over 7 million viewers with the first episode of 8. Aside from a few pounds gained and lost here and there, it was like the last 15 years had never happened. What's a meat raffle? Well, you should know. <laughs> there were a couple of nods to the recession. There aren't any bookshops in Edmonton anymore, or libraries. Your mate George Bleeding Osborne closed them all down. But it was mainly gags at the expense of suburban cougar next door Dorian. Sit on the big side, you sure it's not mutton? <laughs> well, you're the expert. I'm always conflicted when a band I used to like reforms. I was never Birds of a Feather's number one fan, but its verbal repartee always made me smile when it was on. And it still does, when I'm not worrying that with this, open all hours, the Kumars coming to sky and an only Fools and Horses come back threatened, plus the success of Miranda and Mrs Brown, British TV comedy seems to be going backwards. Talking of which... I'm actually a year late doing Celebrity Big Brother. I was uh, arrested as part of uh, Operation U Tree. I denied the allegations and after nine months the police decided that they had no alternative but to just do no further action. Celebrity Big Brother returned to Channel 5 for its 13th series on Friday amid the usual hoo-ha in Richard Desmond's parish magazines. Pantomime villain Jim Davidson summed up the whole enterprise with this edifying pre-match comment. I'm really excited about going into the Big Brother house and I hope there's lots of women with big knockers. I feel dirty now for having succumbed to even a passing professional curiosity about who the 12 celebrities would turn out to be. I discovered that two of the housemates didn't even have a Wikipedia page. But Jim won't have been disappointed. I had in my past been called a homewrecker, which upset me because I'm really not. I was runner-up on this year's Apprentice. It's just been a big, fat roller coaster year. You name it, I've probably been in it. Done Natsu, FHM, Maxim, Loaded. Should I just get them out? From financially embarrassed granddad Evander Holyfield to tiny boy Dappy, they're all essentially prostituting themselves. Why don't they just rename it Celebrity Big Brothel and be done with it? <laughs> Actually, I'm sure there's a devastating cultural thesis to be written about the fact that each housemate comes with their own tabloid cutting, which validates their qualification as a celebrity and allows them to generate further tabloid cuttings. And the fact that the producers have literally handcuffed the inmates together this year is a resonant touch of symbolism. But let's lead them to their tawdry fate, and at the end of Dear One, it's all bollocks. No, 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 it's obvious. That's how he did it. At last, something to get our brains around. The return to BBC One of Sherlock for its third run of three feature-length episodes, and the answer to the question, how did he fake his suicide at the end of series two? Not like that, actually. It's a tease. Typically playful, or typically annoying, depending on where you stand, creators Stephen Moffat and Mark Gatiss never actually confirmed how it was done. But what fun they had in not telling us. Throwing in a kiss with Molly. And a cameo for Darren Brown mind control. John, John look at me, look at me, and sleep. Right the way down, right the way deep. Right the way sound asleep. Neither of which happened, but you're up to speed with that. This first episode, The Empty Hearse, written by Gatiss, when it wasn't relentlessly mocking Sherlock's hardcore fans to see how much they could take, not very much, judging by online reaction, had a mystery to solve. Why had Martin Freeman's Watson grown a moustache? Not sure about that. Hmm? Ages you. Just trying it out. Well, it ages you. 
By which I don't mean why had the fictional character of Dr Watson grown a moustache – he had one in Conan Doyle's books after all and it was Movember – or indeed why had Gatiss grown him one – it proved an amusing trifle and afforded this neat exchange with his fiancée. Mary likes it. Mm, no she doesn't. She does. She doesn't. Oh, brilliant. I'm sorry, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know how to tell you. Brilliant. No, no, this is charming. I've really missed this. The question I'm really asking is what greater significance will the moustache have over the arc of the whole series? Because nothing is there for no reason in Sherlock, and that's why people love it, and people hate it, even the people who love it. Sherlock's doing a while you wait deductathon on Mary, which reveals that she's a Guardian reader. as well as a disillusioned cat lover with a secret Lib Dem tattoo, I think. Mary, of course, played by Martin Freeman's real-life wife, Amanda Arrington. Just as Sherlock's parents, glimpsed in cameo, were played by Benedict Cumberbatch's parents. The worst of you. Would you so please, it's all over. Ring up more often, won't you? <laughs> she worried. Sherlock is quite a proposition. It's so intricately woven and zigzagged with cross-references for those in the know. Yet meanwhile, it's confidently and flashily blockbustered up for the international market, with no trick left unturned. The one criticism you could never make about it is that they're not trying hard enough. It's just that sometimes it can feel like they're trying too hard. Darren Brown. A drama now that's a little more straightforward but which also demands your full attention and has words all over the screen because it's subtitled From Spain, Grand Hotel on Sky Arts 1. Una desgracia lo de tu marido. A cualquiera podría ocurrirle un accidente. Sí. Sería terrible que me ocurriese algo a mí y al niño que llevo dentro. Pero esa criatura no va a protegerte para siempre. Pero la carta sí. Not in the same fashionably overcast league as The Returned, Borgen, or The Bridge, whose second series I'll be catching up with next week, this addictive period pot boiler set in a grand hotel in northern Spain has been compared to Downton, which is not as glib as it sounds. Clearly telegraphed soap-like storylines, which run from murder and illegitimacy to inheritance and death by chandelier, are carried by live Spanish actors largely confined to corridors and rooms. This second series even throws in a bit of Boardwalk Empire-style gun violence. Contrary to what you might expect from a fiery Iberian drama, blood is rarely spilled, and considering all the women are either pregnant or pretending to be pregnant, corsets are rarely unbuttoned. It's mostly housekeeping. There's a clue to the target audience here. I warn you, watch one 80 minute episode and you'll discover that you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. A quick mention for the welcome return of an old BBC war horse, forensic procedural Silent Witness. Now into its 17th series, the franchise constantly refreshes its cast, with only one current principal who's been in it longer than a year. My life has too many moving parts. That's Dr Nicky, played by the slinky Amelia Fox since Series 8, dealing with the death at the end of Series 16 of taciturn father figure Leo by mooning around on his old chair and adopting a doll's hairstyle. Funny how the oddest things can remind you of someone. I don't want anything in this room to change. It already has. Mind you, the new boss, played by the suave Richard Linton, who has crime-beating previous in the shadow line, looks promising. Thomas Chamberlain, consultant forensic pathologist. Jack Hodgson, you the new gaffer. I saw the press release. You're coming into, what was it? Restore confidence in the centre. I didn't know we'd lost anyone's confidence. I didn't write it. Of course not. Sure, it's the grizzly who done it and overlit autopsies that keep us coming back for more, but these would be cold cases indeed without the interpersonal relationships of the pathologists. A solid multi layered opening two parter by Timothy Prager tackled the glamorous world of Premiership football and the less glamorous world of anti Semitism, which unfortunately meant A, a made up Premiership football club who looked like they played at Charlton Athletics Ground but were called <coughs> Thames City, and B, a rather cheesy portrayal of the media. What he did on Twitter was like firebombing their brand. Let's go back to Grand Hotel, which you're never going to watch, for your final moment of zen. Come with me. Nunca fumado opio. Hablar de opio en esos términos es como describir a Venus como dos bechos y una vagina. Tiendas secas. 